got it. Uh, and so, and these recordings will be um, become available on our website after the session. Um, we are very excited to have all of you join us for the eighth Dent Echo. Uh, we have wonderful didactic and case presentations lined up for you today. Um, my name is Kato and I will be assisting in facilitating today's session. Um, for those who may be new to ECHO, um, this is a model that builds virtual communities of practice and learning. Um, sessions begin with a didactic presentations, uh, presentation followed by a de-identified case uh, presentation and group discussion um, to foster deep knowledge and build individual capacity. Um, before we carry on, I will ask Angela, um, our UT ECHO IT, to share some guidance about your audio connection. Hello, everyone. Um, as Cato mentioned, I'm Angela. I'll be helping out with the IT today. Um, just a reminder to please stay muted unless you are speaking. You can mute and unmute using star six on your phone if you have called in or the microphone icon on the bottom left of your screen if you've joined on a computer. You can also communicate with the chat feature. Please remember that no personal health information is allowed when discussing cases and scenarios. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aljo. Um, I would like to move on to um, introductions. Um, please um, say your name, title, and affiliations when I mention your name. Um, Dr. Uh, Akiva. Hi, yes, good morning, or good afternoon, I should say. My name is Dr. Rosalie Aguilar, and I work as one of the um, co-directors for this wonderful Dent Echo Network, along with my colleague Magda, who we'll meet shortly. Um, I'm also a pro program coordinator here at the School of Dentistry for the Holistic Oral Health Program for Elders. Thank you, and um, thank you for joining, and welcome. Thank you, um, Ms. De La Torre. Hi everyone, I'm Magda de la Torre. I am a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Comprehensive Dentistry at our dental school here in San Antonio, as well as the co-director for Dent Echo. And thank you all of you for joining. It's wonderful to see names and faces uh, every two months. So thank you. Dr. Um, Amarista. Hi, how are you everyone? I'm Felix Amarista. I'm an assistant professor of the Oral Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery here at UT Health San Antonio. Thank you for joining. And Dr. Murphy. Uh, yes, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Murphy, staff dentist with CHCSCT and at the Seguin location at this time. And, uh, and a shout out to Vern Lagrega that I saw on just a minute ago. Thank you so much. Um, and to uh, everyone who's joined this session, please enter your name, title, and affiliation into the chat um, to help us with attendance and also so that we can get to know each other um, through the chat. A um, few announcements from us. Um, if you haven't already completed the pre-session questionnaire, um, you can do this um, now using the link um, that Dr. Aguilar shared. Um, in the chat box. Um, and uh, if you selected that you would like to receive continuing education credits in your registration, we will follow up by email with um, instructions for completing the post-session um, evaluation and attaining your credits. Um, ECHO is an all teach all learn supportive model and ECHOs thrive on the interaction from the full learning network. So we encourage all to participate in the conversation today. We also encourage you to join by video if you can. Um, so that we can see your beautiful faces, um, especially during the discussion part um, of the session. Um, our session today will include a didactic presentation from Dr. Amarista on managing the diabetes patient and oral surgeon's perspective, and a case presentation um, from Dr. Murphy. And as a reminder, you can use the chat to raise questions and comments at any point during the session. Um, Dr. Amarista, when you are ready, um, please share your slides and take it away. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and you guys let me know if you can see it. Yes, we see it. Thank Perfect. You. So we're good to go? Yes. Great. So good afternoon, everyone. I, I'm Felix Amarista, as I mentioned before. I'm an oral surgeon, part of the Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery at UT Health San Antonio. 
And today I'm really thankful for the opportunity from Dan Echo to present about managing the diabetes patient and oral surgeon perspective. Every time I give a lecture, I try to mention where I come from. I was born in Caracas, Venezuela in South America, but I spent pretty much my entire childhood in this beautiful island, Margarita Island. Then I moved to Caracas again, which is the capital city of Venezuela to do dental school there. After my dental school, my oral surgery beginning started in this hospital in Caracas, which is called the, the Dr. Domingo Luciani Hospital. And then I decided to move to uh, Bogota, Colombia, uh, and did a formal residency there. My dream was always to come to the US. So I, I feel really uh, proud and grateful for the opportunity that I had at UT Health San Antonio. So I did my residency again in here. And today I can mention really proud that I'm part of this department and I stay as a faculty with teaching all residents. For the lecture today, uh, I have mainly four objectives. The first one is review the pathophysiology of diabetes and associated risk factors. Uh, we wanna try to comprehend the importance of patient evaluation and risk assessment. We wanna try to identify the risk associated with different oral surgery procedures and the patient with diabetes. And we're going to review some of the complications and how they manifest and how we can treat them. So introduction, if we go to the dictionary and look what is diabetes, it is defined as a disease in which the body's ability to produce or respond to the hormone insulin is impaired. And this results in an abnormal metabolism of carbohydrates and elevated levels of glucose in the blood and urine. And we're going to see later that this has an important impact in the patient's health. Every time I talk about something, I always try to go back and see what's the history associated with this, because I think if we know what happened in the past, we can understand better what's happening now. And when we look at the history of diabetes, we go that it goes back all the way to the second century before Christ, in where Cappadocian was the first one that described, he was the, the first accurate description about diabetes. Then on the 17th centuries, Thomas Willis it was the one that included the term mellitus. And this is to describe an extremely sweet taste of the urine, which I don't know how they thought about <laughs> tasting the urine, but that's what happened. In the 19th centuries, Claude Bernard uh, discovered the glycogenic action of the liver. Then Minoski and von Meering in 19th centuries, they were the first one that described that this was a disease of the pancreas. And then in the 20th centuries, Banting, Best, and McLeod were the ones that discovered the insulin. And actually, when I was reading the history, I thought that this experiment that they did was really interesting. What they did is that they were working with dogs. And so some dogs, they went ahead and removed the pancreas. And when they removed the pancreas, they put the pancreas and they freeze the pancreas. And then they kind of smash everything and uh, went ahead and, and mixed that with saline. And to other dogs that, were that had diabetes because of they removed the pancreas, they injected this, this solution that was made from, from pancreas with saline, and they saw that their blood sugars went down. So that's how they discovered that the pancreas had a substance, in this case, the insulin, that decreased the blood sugar when you, put, when you inject it in patients. Now, and recently, Unfortunately, I say this, 450 million people worldwide have diabetes. Uh, the global uh, diabetes prevalence for 2019 was almost 10%, which I think is really, really high. In the US, 30, 37 million of people have diabetes. And from those, 28 are diagnosed and eight are not. We remember that diabetes is a group of metabolic disorders characterized and identified by the presence of hyperglycemia in the absence of treatment. And in general, we're gonna talk about a little more about this, but in general, uh, we classify diabetes or the new classification is in four, type one, type two, and then other specific type and gestational. Some of the symptoms associated with diabetes, there are some of the cardinal classic symptoms, the triple P, polyphagia, polydipsia, and polyuria. However, there are other not that specific symptoms like dehydration, increased risk of infection, neuropathy, uh, dyslipidemia, uh, vascular disease, and others. 
how that works in a normal situation, when I have a patient that is not diabetic, we see that in the bloodstream, we're going to have insulin secreted by the pancreas and we're going to have blood sugar. When the insulin leaves the bloodstream and goes to the cell, it, it activates the cells. And in response to this, the cells is able to take the blood sugar and then use it as a fuel. When we have type 1 diabetes, as we know, the type 1 diabetes, there's no production at all of insulin. So we have blood sugar in the bloodstream that goes out of the uh, uh, vessels and try to go to the cell. However, because of the cell doesn't have the insulin, it's unable to take that glucose. Now, on the type 2 is a little different. It's what we call an insulin resistance. So even though we have insulin and we have sugar, when that insulin goes out to the cell, the cell cannot be activated. And, and because of that, the cell cannot take the glucose. So both are problems in where we have high levels of glucose in bloodstream, but one is different than the other. Now in the classification, type one is we consider autoimmune or idiopathic. Type two is mainly insulin resistant and is associated with, with um, obesity and other comorbidities. In general, type 1 is going to require for sure insulin because they don't produce any it, to um, survive. Type 2, other, and gestational, sometimes they don't require insulin. There's other medications we can do, uh, use for that. So my goal today is not for you guys to remember every single one of the medications that are used to uh, control the diabetes. But if, if you have to learn something from this slide is... We have some medications that we can take orally and some medications that are basically orally and are not insulin itself. And then some medications that are insulin. Now, the most important probably part of this is to know that they have different half-lives. And by knowing the half-lives of the medications, we can know and understand why some of the medications we're gonna stop before surgery or before any procedure and why some of them we're gonna still use. Same with the insulin. They're basically the right rapid acting, short acting, intermediate, long acting, and some mixed insulins. In general, um, if we look at the A1C level, we know that a patient that has a really low A1C below seven, below six, five, is gonna usually be treated with a monotherapy. The minute we start going up, those, those patients are gonna require more medication. So, the way that I see this slide is if I have a patient that I don't know the A1C, but the patient tells me that they're taking four medications to control the diabetes, most likely at some point, at least that diabetes was not well controlled. So I think that this is kind of good information we can start getting from just asking the patients what medications are taking. This is a, 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 a little table that I saw and it kind of impressed me a lot. This is basically how many years the patients are losing by being diagnosed with diabetes. So if somebody's diagnosed at age 10, they're gonna, their life expectancy is going to go down 17 years. And of course, the later you're diagnosed, the less years you're going to lose. But even though if I diagnose with diabetes at year 40, that means that I'm going to live 10 years less, which I think is impressive. Some of the general complications about diabetes, metabolic disturbances, cardiovascular, eyes, kidneys, extremities, neuropathy, and early death. Now, we're gonna go back to maybe what you guys wanted to hear today. What's gonna be the dental management? How I'm gonna treat those patients when they get to my clinic? In general, I want you guys to understand that we are um, in the medical field and we can help. We, I, I try to see this as, I'm not just gonna think about the tooth that I'm gonna extract. I'm thinking about the patient that I have in front of me. So 50% of all patients are undiagnosed. So every one of every two patients that you see might have diabetes that you don't know. So you, you could potentially contribute to diagnose that patient. So if we see some of the cardinal signs and symptoms of diabetes, refer to a physician. If you see findings suggested of diabetes, which are not that specific, but one of those is progressive periodontal disease, paresthesia. These are things that we can see in our clinical evaluation. Maybe try to talk to that patient and refer to a primary care doctor. So hopefully they can get diagnosed. If I have a patient with clinical detection of diabetes, 
what are the things that I want to know? Number one, if the patient is already diagnosed with diabetes or not, what are the medications they're taking? Are, are they being treated by a physician or they just don't take medications? And then we want to see the degree and severity of the diabetes, how controlled they are and how severe it is. How? Just asking questions. When you were diagnosed, what's your usually blood glucose level? What's the, um, how, what you take? Do you use insulin? Have you been admitted for this? And then if I have a patient that doesn't have diabetes, we're going to look for signs and symptoms that we already talked before. And then we should also think about patients that are at higher risk to develop diabetes. And those patients maybe try to refer to get diagnosed before. This is a kind of a really short summary. It is impossible for us to determine. I think that we always try to look for guidelines and 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 help on when to treat, when not to treat, but unfortunately we're treating patients so there's no black and white. In general, this is based on A1C levels. Ideally, if I'm gonna do a procedure, the patient should be in between six and eight, but I say ideally, not necessarily means that if the patient is not there, I cannot do a procedure. Now, if it's between five and six or eight to nine, I can go and ask uh, their doctor to see if the patient is clear for surgery. But definitely if I have lower than five or greater than nine, 10, those are patients that typically, if we can, we should postpone the surgery, at least if that surgery is an elective or that procedure is an elective procedure. When we look at levels, really low levels of A1C, we're thinking of that patient can have a hypoglycemic coma. And when we have a really high levels of A1C, we need to think about diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, I have the patient, I decide that I'm gonna do something. So how is my pre-op pre assessment? I wanna know what therapy they're on, what's their A1C level. We wanna try to assess for end organ damage. Uh, we're going to ask the patient how many times they have hypoglycemia, have they been admitted. One of the things that is important is that diabetes can ascend, uh, affect the joints. So there's a way to check for joint rigidity, and that's a prayer test. And we want to see if the patients can uh, put their palms together. In general, I think we all know this. We're going to try to schedule morning appointments. We want to try to remember uh, that there is an increased risk for ischemia and increased risk for aspiration, especially we're doing sedation due to gastroparesis. So as we know, diabetes affect the motility of the GI system. And, and because of that, those patients are higher risk for aspiration. Now, management of meds. This is especially for general anesthesia and IV sedation, or in general, a patient that is not going to be eating or is going to be in NPO for a while. If I'm using, if the patient is taking oral anti-diabetic medication in general, we're gonna try to stop that one the day of the surgical procedure. So they take it the day before, and then they don't take it when you're gonna do surgery. If the patient is in insulin the day before the surgical procedure, usually you don't wanna change the basal insulin regimen. And the day of the surgical procedure, if they have insulin pump, technically there's no change. You don't have to do anything because insulin pump is monitoring the levels of the blood sugar, and based on that is when he's delivering uh, medications. If you ask an anesthesiologist, most likely they're going to basically turn off the pump because they feel better by uh, uh, measuring the blood sugar level and then by managing the uh, dose. Long-acting insulin, 75% or 100% of the morning dose, intermediate-acting around 50% of their dose, and short-acting and rapid-acting, we're just going to hold the dose. Intra management. Again, if I'm doing sedation or, or general anesthesia, I want to use normal saline. We want to keep the patients hydrated. We have to remember that it's really common that patients with uh, diabetes become, tend to be dehydrated. If I'm concerned for hypoglycemia, I can use either 5% dextrose or I can use 50%. I'll, I'll show you in a minute, but the doses are going to change a little bit. And in general, you want to try to avoid lactated ringer. And the reason is because the, the liver sometimes can convert the lactate to glucose, so it's going to elevate the blood sugar even more. We want to monitor the blood sugar. The range that we want to be is in between 80 to 200. If we're below 80, we're higher risk to develop a hypoglycemia. If we're by, uh, above 200, then we have risk for other complications. And we're going to manage the hypo or hypoglycemia accordingly. Post-op management, 
you have to consider, we're gonna talk about this a little more, consider antibiotics for patients with poorly controlled diabetes because they have an increased risk of infection. You're gonna to try to encourage that patient to resume their normal diet as soon as possible. And then after they're eating, usually they're good and they can manage their uh, blood sugar with the medications that they're prescribed. So now I'm gonna talk some about some of the specific scenarios or situations in where when I have a patient with diabetics, what should I do? So antibiotics first, should I use antibiotic? Yes or no. So a patient that has a disease under control generally does not require antibiotic. However, this is gonna be based on what's also, what's the procedure that I'm doing. Prophylactic antibiotics generally are not required. We need to remember that uncontrolled diabetes is equal to a compromised immune system. And this is what I mentioned before. The reason is because the neutrophil adherence, chemotaxis, phagocytosis, bacterial activity, and cell-mediated immunity is compromised. So this patient is going to have more risk for infection. Antibiotics in general are indicated for uncontrolled diabetes with invasive procedures. And it is important that when we have an infection, we're going to manage those infections aggressively by incision and drainage extraction and antibiotic. We don't want to wait too much on managing this patient. This is uh, 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 something that I found in an article that was from general surgery. It's not from our literature, but I thought it was impressive that uh, the risk for infection is directly proportional to how uncontrolled is the diabetes and the blood sugar level. So if we see that the fasting glucose level is below 206, usually the patient doesn't have an increased risk for infection. If the blood glucose level is between 207 to 229, in their literature, they see that there's a 20% increased risk. However, if the patient is above 230, they mention up to 80% increased risk. So I think that's really impressive and it's a really big number. So if we have a patient that uncontrolled diabetes, most likely we're gonna require the antibiotic. Now, what about extensive surgery? Can I do surgery or not in these patients? So if the patient is, the diabetes is well controlled, in general, you can proceed with the treatment. You don't have to modify anything. If you're concerned about the, extensive of the, the extent of the procedure and if the patient is not gonna be able to eat after, it will be a good idea for you to contact their PCP so we can see and try to um, um, coordinate what's going to be the diet after. If the diabetes is not well controlled, which in general is blood sugar below 70 or above 200, other comorbidities, a high blood pressure, more than 180, 110, and the functional capacity below four meds, we just need to provide with appropriate emergency care only, or, and if that's the case, we have to explain the patient that there's a higher risk, but at this point, the benefits from doing that emergency care is higher than the risk that the patient have, and you just discuss that with them. If, and you're gonna refer that patient for evaluation, management, and risk factor modification. Now, if the patient is symptomatic, has other symptoms, chest pain, a, sweating, or you think that that patient is uncontrolled, you want to try to seek immediate referral. If the patient is asymptomatic, routine referral is okay. Now, what about extractions? Can I do extraction or not in patients with diabetes? There's different literature. I'm going to show you three articles that I found that were interested in looking at this. In this first one, they say that type 1 and type 2 diabetes, if well controlled, tend to heal up well following dental extractions but with a small but not a statistically different rate of post-extraction complications, including infection. So yes, there's a little higher risk, but in general, they heal just fine. This second article, they said that patients with that type 2 diabetes should be treated the same as a non-diabetic patients for extractions. And this last one say that dental extractions can be performed safely it's safely in optimal controlled diabetes with minimal complications. So as we know, if the patient is controlled, no, don't worry, just proceed with the surgery. If it's not controlled and you have to do the surgery because there's an infection, then just explain the patient's their higher risk and try to contact their doctor to have uh, their diabetes better control. What about dental implants? I think this is one of the ones that probably most people want to try to hear. So 
Then on implants, we, we know that when there's hyperglycemia, there is a re, it reduces the form formation, bone formation, inhibits the osteoclastic differentiation, alters, alters the response of the parathyroid hormone in the metabolism of the calcium and phosphate, affects adherence, growth, and accumulation with the extracellular matrix. And when we have a patient with hyperglycemia, we can have bone loss up to 40%. And this is directly related to poor control of the diabetes. So in general, for the patients that are going to go, diabetes patients that are going to go dental implants, we want to try to do those patients when they have A1Cs between below 7 is ideal. And insulin directly stimulates the formation of osteoblastic matrix. That means that if this patient is controlled and their blood sugars is down and is taking their insulin, this is going to be beneficial for the survival of the implants. This is a study I found that I thought it was really good. It's not that new, but it's a group of, of uh, doctors that try to look for the bone formation around titanium implants in the rat tibia. And they wanted to see what was the role in the insulin on this. So they saw, or, or their introduction, they mentioned insulin stimulates the bone formation. They saw that the bone implant interface observed in diabetics under the influence of insulin resemble a normal osseointegration process, which is almost to a patient that doesn't have diabetes. And they mentioned that the most important is that the control of the metabolic status of the patient is essential for successful osseointegration. And we're gonna look at that in this chart. So they divided, they had three groups, a control group, a group, a group with diabetes not controlled, and a group with diabetes and insulin. And we see bone growth area, we see that the control group and the group with diabetes and control with insulin behave really well, both at 10 and 21 days. And the bone implant contact surface is pretty much the same. We see that patients controlled with insulin behave pretty much the same. Well, in this case, no patients, rats, they behave really well and almost uh, identical to patients or to rats that, that were in the control group. Two systematic reviews and meta-analysis that I found. This ones were more recent, 2016, and the other one I believe is 2016 also. They mentioned that poorly controlled diabetes leads to impaired osseointegration, elevated risk of perimplantitis, and higher risk of implant failure. Superative administration of antibiotics and chlorhexidine seems to improve dental implant success. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this. And control diabetes implant procedures are safe and predictable with similar complication rate. These other systematic review meta-analysis published in the International Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery, they mentioned that the implant failures do not differ between diabetic and non-diabetic patients control. Comparison between one and two, type one and type two, show no difference, and the marginal bone loss has a statistically significant difference favoring the non-diabetic subjects. That means that in that, in that regards, you have more bone loss if you have a patient with uncontrolled diabetes versus a patient that doesn't have it. Based on what I read in this, uh, for this review, in general, the implant survival rates for uncontrolled diabetes go all the way from 86 to 91%, controlled diabetes, 96%, and healthy patients from 93 to 98. So that tells me if I'm discussing with a patient that is a controlled diabetic and I'm thinking of putting dental implants, I think that success rate is pretty much similar. Now, if I have a patient that is uncontrolled, I think that these numbers, I thought that they were going to be lower than this, but I mean, probably I wouldn't do a dental implants on patients with uncontrolled diabetes until at least they show me that they're interested in having the disease better control. So if we decide that we're going to do dental implants on patients with diabetes, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to eradicate comorbidities. I want to control their whole hygiene. I want to hopefully for a patient that it doesn't smoke and I want to control the periodontitis. Glycemic control, glycemic control, as I mentioned before, ideally H1C, A1C levels below six and below seven. And then this preventative measures against infections. These numbers were really impressive for me, but I guess that they work really well. Chlorhexidine by use reduces the failure rate of, um, uh, of losing the implant from 13.5 to 4.4%. And then if I use pre-op antibiotics in patients with diabetes, the implant failure rate goes from 13.4 to 2.9. 
So definitely I will recommend to use both antibiotics and chlorhexidine when you're doing implants for diabetes patients. And I mentioned this, I think that every time we have a patient with comorbidities, it is important that we do a really good follow-up and we keep track on them and see what, how they're doing. I'm gonna mention some of the complications we can face when we're treating patients with diabetes. The most common one is hypoglycemia, and usually this is associated with the patient that didn't stop the medication and has eaten anything. So number one thing is administration of the glucose should be performed promptly with hypoglycemia suspected. And the literature shows and the data shows that you should not delay the administration of glucose to obtain a blood sugar level if you don't have it in there. The reason is because the risk for acute hypoglycemia is greater than the risk for hyperglycemia. So if I don't know what's happening, I should try to think that I'm facing a hypoglycemia, not necessarily a hyperglycemia. How we're gonna treat it, we're gonna try to recognize the problem. We're gonna discontinue the treatment for sure. Patient, put the patient comfortably. And we're gonna do ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, everything we do every time we have a complication, we're gonna admin some oxygen. And then uh, I'm gonna to try to administer some glucose. If uh, I have glucose tablets, gel, juices, sweet, uh, um, any sweet candies or something, if the patient is conscious. If the patient responds appropriately, you just want to encourage that patient to eat some complex carbohydrates and discharge when the patient is stable. If the patient does not respond, then I have to move forward and try to give some IM or IV glucagon or dextrose. If the patient is unconscious, the first time, the first part is pretty much the same. The only thing is I'm not going to try to patient to drink some soda. We're going to, if we have an IV, we're going to give some dextrose solution. Uh, this is for people that are doing IV sedations. If you're using 5% dextrose, you're going to give 10 cc per kilo. If you're using 50%, 1 cc per kilo. If you don't have an IV, IV or IM glucagon uh, work at uh, 0.1 milligrams per kilo. There's other some syrups that you can use even if you don't have an IV and the patient is unconscious. You can put that syrup in your finger and basically put it in the patient's oral mucosa. If the patient responds appropriately, same, you can encourage that patient to eat some carbohydrates. If the patient does not recover, you wanna try to activate EMS because that can be a, a life-threatening complication. Hyperglycemia is usually associated with a diabetic ketoacidosis. That will be the worst complication. And this is typically happens in type one diabetics. It is considered a medical emergency. So you're gonna activate EMS immediately. There's some symptoms associated with this, some non-specific like nausea, vomiting, polyuria, abdominal pain, cosmo respirations is most likely, it's kind of the classic sign of DKA. And this is how your patient will look like. They will have some deep gasping labyrinth breathing. If the patient has DKA, it's going to be acidotic, dehydrated, hyperglycemic, and will have some ketones bodies in their blood and urine. And this treatment, the treatment for this requires admission in the hospital, IV fluids, insulin, and stuff that we're not going to deal with that is going to be treated in the hospital. Another uh, possible complication I can face when I have a patient with diabetes, as we've been discussed today, is infection. So when we think about infection, we know that this is a dynamic process in between the microbial factors and the host factors. So if I have a patient completely healthy, most likely he's not going to get infected. But what happens if I go and affect the host factors by having an uncontrolled diabetes. This balance is not gonna have any more, and then you have risk for infection. So the diabetes, does diabetes control with infections? A critical examination of literature does not seem to support the role of diabetes as a definitive risk factor, definitive. That doesn't mean that it's not a risk factor, but it's not definitive. This second article mentions that correlation between facial cellulitis and diabetes patients was confirmed. And for them in their group, they saw that risk of occurrence of infection is 1400 times uh, greater in a patient with uncontrolled diabetes versus control group. And this last one says that patients with diabetes, uh, diabetics and patients with a normal glucose tolerance show significantly higher numbers of severe odontogenic infections. So, 
uh, they might uh, therefore benefit from earlier escalation of antibiotic medication. As an example, I'm gonna show you one case so we can uh, finish soon. This is a 64 year old male that was, had uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, he had recent dental extractions done by his general dentist. Week later, he went back to the clinic, he got infected, they prescribed antibiotic. He didn't improve with the antibiotics and two weeks later, he was transferred to the UH for management of facial abscess. His MIR, his mouth opening was just 10 millimeters. This is the initial presentation of the patient, severe swelling to the right, a, a lower and upper jaw. We see involving the buccal space and also some swelling that is hard to see here because of the hair, but a, a, a involving the temporal area. This is a CT scan with contrast we took in the hospital. One of the things that you guys need to notice is even though it's not that bad, we can tell that the airway is deviated or pushed to the other side. We also see a rene enhancement fluid collection involving the buccal space, the masticator, masticator, uh, masticator space, and involving the, the uh, peripheral space on the right side. And then on the coronal views, we see the same in fluid collection that also were around, was around the condylar and the TMJ. So for this patient, we took him to the OR. Um, we uh, did this procedure under general anesthesia we had to do a Gillies incision, which is an incision we do in the temporal area so we can get to the temporal space. And I'll show you here. This doesn't work really well. Let's see, maybe I had a video. Give me one second, I'm gonna try. Okay. And then this is how we did. We had to do an extra oil incision and drainage, and we can see how much of fluid collection, and in this case, pus, we got from the area. This is usually what happened with patients with uncontrolled diabetes that does not respond to antibiotics. So we do the controlled infection like we always do. The main problem with those is that usually the length of stay in the hospital is, is increased because of the amount of medications they have to give. And usually we wanna to try to make sure that the patient is basically healed before we discharge. And this is a post-op with all the drains that we usually flush for two, three days and then remove them. Another complication, and I'm about to finish, mucormucosis is extremely rare. There's only 31 cases published in the literature, but I thought it was good to at least you guys know that this exists. The mortality is about 40% despite surgical treatment and antibiotics and antifungal treatment. It occurs more often in diabetic and immunocompromised patients. The prevalence in the U.S. is 0 0.01 to 0 0.2 per 100,000 a population, dental extractions might create a portal of entry of the fungal infection. And the way that it will look like is similar to when we have a patient with hemorrhage, necrotic bone, and x-rays with op opacification of the sinuses. So you most likely will never see this, but if you see something like this, at least think that this is a possibility. Take home points. Diabetes is undiagnosed as many as 50% of the patients. Refer the patient to a physician when finding suggestive of diabetes. Remember, we can be helpful in diagnosing patients that don't know that they have diabetes. It is important to establish the severity of the disease and the degree of control. How? Asking what type of medic uh, the diabetes a patient has, what medications they're on, their last way A1C, if they're being admitted or not. If I have a patient that is going to go a uh, surgery or any procedure under IV sedation, general anesthesia, and is not going to be eating, I want to hold the anti-diabetic medications appropriately. You remember what I mentioned, you have to consider the type and the half-life of the medications. Consider antibiotic for uncontrolled diabetes and invasive procedures. Proceed with extraction of diabetes is controlled. If it's not controlled, provide emergency care only and try to refer the patient to have a better control of their disease. Implants are not contraindicated. However, control of the metabolic status of the diabetes is essential for successful osseointegration. Consider antibiotic and chlorhexidine to decrease the dental implant failure rate from 13 to 2.9. Recognize and treat complications associated with diabetes and refer promptly. This is really important. We don't wanna get complicated in our office. If we think that there's something that is not going right or is going wrong really bad, then just call EMS and refer a patient. And the last one that I try to mention and, and remember, uh, remind my residents is that we're treating patients. 
we still need to do a really good clinical exam. We have to diagnose and see what's going on. We have to do a risk assessment. And at the end, we have to define their treatment based on that patient and not just based on protocols. If you guys want to read a little bit more about these topics, I recommend, strongly recommend these two books. Uh, one is anesthesia considerations in, for the oral maxillofacial surgery, and the other one is the dental management of medically compromised patients. Those are really, really good when you have patients with um, diseases that we're not used to treat. They, they do a really good job summarizing all the information, and thank you so much. I hope I didn't take too long. Thank you so much, Dr. Marista. If you could um, um, share the slide so we can see yes, it. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one or two questions if anybody have any questions. I agree with, the, with um, Dr. Dar. Um, that was a very informative presentation. Thank you so much. Um, if nobody have any questions, we would like to move forward to with the case presentation. Um, Angela, could you please share um, Dr. Murphy's slides? And Dr. Murphy, whenever you're ready, please take it away. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yes, we can. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. This is um, Dr. Murphy with the Community Health Centers of South Central Texas at the Seguin Clinic. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to share an experience with you and thank Dr. Amarista for her for his wonderful background information on diabetes. My account here, my anecdotal uh, accounting to you is regarding a 59 year old Hispanic female who came to our clinic with tooth pain, which is significant motivator for many of our patients. Not having background, not always having advanced background on the medical, on the medical history, other than what is disclosed on our medical history form, uh, we proceed to try to understand the patient's discomfort, which requires listening. After observing uh, this patient and just listening to her story, she is there because of uh, pain, which she has reporting has become more and more current. She's been experiencing discomfort for quite a while. She says she's had uh, an experience with uh, diabetic treatment, but it was two years ago from the time I saw her. She was not real clear on what, the, uh, what her A1C or what her description of her diabetes was, but she said she had diabetes. Something occurred in her life undisclosed, which caused her to uh, back away from medical care at that time. She was having some treatments and was on medications, but but she desisted from continuing the care. She also was being treated by counseling regarding some emotional issues, which also were not disclosed. But after a period of time, now about two years, she now was uh, feeling a little bit better for reasons unknown, but she now is having pain. She reports to our clinic, we take our x-rays and my first my first uh, consideration with her was that she had, I gave her a label here of systemic inflammatory gingival hyperplasia. The characteristics, I'm not sure what, uh, what, uh, what slide will be appearing here, but I will keep talking and we'll see, we can change slides at any time. That's a good place. Uh, was to, uh, take a look to listen to how she describes her problem, which was her mouth hurts, her teeth hurt, her gums hurt. She has difficulty chewing and eating. She's having difficulty sleeping. She has blood on her pillow. I can detect 
uh, an odor with her. Uh, and she also reflects to a tooth problem on the upper right, a loose tooth, a mobile tooth on the upper right. With some observation of this, and again, this I considered the characteristics of her gums, which were my first observation was hyperplastic and highly inflamed. Another word, another word might be edematous for these tissues. I was thinking she had maybe a response, tissue response to an anticonvulsant medication. However, as we proceed on this, and as she divulges slowly her history of some stress factors that caused her to back off of her previous medication, I then start looking back over her health history a bit. And she does have only slight representation of um, diabetes. But the characteristics become more apparent. With these pictures, you can see what I, what I saw, which is in some areas, the tissue that's more than just inflamed, it bleeds upon probing. And you can see the swelling of those gum tissues. Another characteristic here is that she appeared to have no dental caries, which is always interesting. So approaching the probing situation and the consideration certainly of a periodontal aspect to this and not wanting to just focus on that, I'm consenting, um, uh, considering other, other uh, characteristics here, which are that she's not eating and a better representation of her history of diabetes. So mo moving ahead with this, um, we have a patient who I'm developing a better picture of her overall wellness, but at the same time, we have an acute problem because part of our mission in seeing toothaches and people who are in immediate and acute distress is to try to help her with her immediate problem, considering what else needs to happen and how to best represent that. So, after talking to her, she is, she is now at a point of being receptive to referral for an evaluation and for my suggesting to her that we may be still working on a problem of an unmanaged diabetic. She's receptive to this. And from here, she does go on to make, after we leave here today, she has gone on to make her follow her referral and to pick up her relationship with her medical doctor. I put her on antibiotic and um, Paradex and suggested that and also encouraged her to take some nutrition to increase her nutrition to soft foods and to uh, some liquid supplements. Now, after referring her and looking back over what information was available to me through our medical department, she had come to us with at least a representation of a uh, number 11 AC1, A1C. After treatment with our medical department, after taking the medication, she returned and I was able to uh, reevaluate her upon her uh, revisiting her medical treatment and uh, following up on what medications had been prescribed for her. And I'll stop there for a minute. The medications that were ultimately prescribed were uh, uh, pretty much the, uh, the medications that Dr. Amarista referenced in his slides for treatment but she was compliant. And as I saw her, it might've been even three weeks later, she was significantly improved and she was comfortable. She had reacquainted herself with a counselor and was significantly more interested in her long-term uh, welfare. 
So having said that, I uh, am just going to review back on the inflammatory characteristics that are generated by diabetic uh, characteristics and uh, medications involved and a, and a reflection on Dr. Amarista's slides regarding the cause of uh, diabetes. Also, one last statement regarding this is that um, when we see our patients, although right now we're quite aware of uh, diabetes being a factor and we're very concerned about it, and as, as there's more and more uh, interest in diabetes, we're, we're incorporating that into our earlier assessments of dental acute uh, discomfort. So having said that, our patient at this point as a good note is improving, having taken an A1C from an 11, that is as earliest reported that we have, but down to an eight with improved attitude, improved motivation to improve herself, and now ready to work with a treatment plan to accommodate her original uh, complaints of bleeding gums and a loose tooth. So with that, I will uh, conclude my report. Thank you for the opportunity to visit with you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Murphy. Um, so here, um, the questions for um, the learning network or the team. Um, participants here. Um, if you can share the slide, Angela. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Murphy or any comments? I think these were interesting cases, the cases that were presented uh, by Dr. Murphy, the case. And then of course, Dr. Marista, your presentation was very thorough, concise, and gave us some very good information that we can apply. We'd like to hear from the learning community on here to see if you have any questions or thoughts about our presentation, any messages you're taking with you that you can apply. I know we don't have a shy community here. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Well, I'll ask my own question <laughs> right there. Um, is there <clears throat> in the, in as much as I presented to you, is there anyone, are there some people out there, including Dr. Amarista, who would approach this differently from my perspective? That is as a first encounter dental pain project with the presentation of the tissues, as well as I have them uh, presented on those slides. I'll make a comment. I think that the easiest way was, and we do sometimes, and I don't think it's the right way, is to forget about what's happening with the patient and just look at the dental pain and see if you need to do an extraction, a cavity or perio treatment and forget about the rest. And one of the things that you didn't do was to do exactly that. You approach the patient as a, as a whole, and, and I think you were able to diagnose it or at least to have an idea of what was happening. And just by sending the patient to the physician and getting their uh, disease better control, you saw that immediately the patient had got a good response. So I think that that's the takeaway point in here. We sometimes can be the first ones looking at diseases or characteristics or symptoms or signs 
And just by looking at their mouth, we can help them go and get treatment for their disease. So I think, which it is important to remember that this disease has some implications in the mouth, yes, but there's a way bigger and more aggressive and dangerous implications in other organs, like heart, kidneys, and stuff like that. And by doing what you did, you might, you know, help the patient not to have a, 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 a worse complication later. So I think it was great. But you think maybe I was a little too global uh, initially, a little too global in consideration, and it might help to be a little more focused. To be, Would if you, you read, if you want to know my honest answer, I think being global is always good. Because <laughs> that means that you're taking care of the whole situation and at least you're thinking about the whole situation. So I, I, I mean, being focused is good because you solve one problem, but then you tend to forget the global picture. And I think. We have a comment um, and question from Violetta Ro. Um, in the chat. Would you like to, Violetta, would you like to unmute and ask? Yeah, I read that. Do you, somebody wants to read it or you want me to read it here? Well, my, my comment was just that it makes me feel a little bit more hesitant because we have, we work in community dentistry. We treat a very high, you know, a, a, a majority population of indigent patients, a lot of them with uncontrolled diabetes. So I'm wondering, like, it makes me actually more hesitant to feel like I, I thought coming into this that I felt comfortable <laughs> treating them, but this makes me more hesitant to say, maybe I'm doing more harm than good. Do they need to be going to oral surgery? And what is the standard of care? To, to doing oral surgery on these patients. Like, should we, we do check blood glucose the day of surgery. And I know blood glucose changes throughout the day. I get that. Um, but as the standard of care in oral surgery now to get an A1C before we're performing oral surgery. So that's a great comment. I don't think there's an extent, I mean, it's not required to have an A1C, but the A1C is the only test we have right now that will really give you an idea of what's happening with their blue blood glucose level in the past three months. So if I take a blood sugar the day of the surgery and the patient hasn't needed anything in one day, that blood sugar might be low and that doesn't mean that the patient diabetes is well controlled. Now, it gives you an idea. So if that's the only thing you have, I would take it. In terms of doing or not doing the procedure, I'll be honest with you, I try to apply that for every single surgery or procedure that I do. I go risk and benefits. If the patient is in pain, is infected and stuff like that, you might do more harm by not doing the procedure and waiting for that patient to be seen by an oral surgeon and all like that. But at least they need to understand if the, the risks associated with the procedure. And in this case, for example, consider the antibiotic, consider the chlorhexidine if you don't know if that patient is well controlled. I don't know if I answer your question, but. Thank you so much. Does anybody else have any questions, comments? Hello. I don't know if you can see me. Hi, I'm Dr. Murdoy. I'm from UTSA. Dr. Marisa, congratulations. Great talk. And Dr. Murphy. Uh, I, I want to just sit on and just add a comment about that. Uh, Dr. Marisa just said what I tell my students all the time is just to see every single pace, patient as a total, as a just the, the person. And it's important just to know if it's an emergency or how origin is the procedure. If the patient is bad to say it, but sometimes pain is not a, a real emergency. If it's something that, I, that can wait for that patient to go back to the physician and get better um, on like control, that will be the best option for that patient. But if it's something that can get worse in days, like infections, especially patients that are immunosuppressed with this diabetes, is something that, like Dr. Marista says, something that you should do um, uh, before sending that patient to a physician. Of course, knowing that it's the knowing DKA or it's not something that needs to go to the emergency department.
Thank you, Dr. Bordori for, Bordori, for your comment. There's another comment on our chat as well. And, and um, from Bruce, would you like to turn your um, microphone on or I can we can read your question? But Bruce's concern was that sometimes- Read away, I'm on, I'm on my phone, so it's kind of difficult. Okay, thank you, Bruce. So what we were saying, what Bruce's comments is that another consideration is that the patients are unlikely to follow up sometimes on specialty referrals to an oral surgeon due to finances. Yeah. That's why I think the message is not, don't treat these patients and send them to oral surgery. I think the message is, evaluate the patient as a whole, uh, assess the risks with the patient and do a really good informed concern and try to make decisions based on that individual patient you have in front of you and not necessarily based on a number, a guideline or stuff like that. So I'm also hearing that very good communication with your patients is important so that you can come to a you know, patient-centered care that's holistic. I'm watching a time when it's um, one, um, so I would like to end this session. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining um, the eighth Dent Echo. Um, thank you particularly to Dr. Amarista for um, a very informative um, didactic presentation, and also Dr. Murphy for um, an amazing case. Um, we hope to see you um, in two months um, on July 21st um, at noon for the next Dent Echo. Um, thank you again, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you.